What is up, everybody? I've got a great guest on today and Coach Phil Martelli. This is going to be a spectacular interview, I believe. Uh, Coach Martelli is a legend in Philadelphia sports, in my opinion. I don't think it's really an opinion. I think it's a fact. Uh, he was the head coach of St. Joseph's University for a number of years, and now he's the associate head coach at the University of Michigan under Jawan Howard. So we're going to talk a lot about Philly sports. We're going to talk a lot about coaching. What does it take to be a coach? And how do you be successful in that industry? Because there's so many changes that have gone on in the college landscape over the last couple of years with the transfer portal, the NIL, the name, image, and likeness. A lot of legendary coaches retiring, Coach K, Jay Wright retiring. And uh, it's gonna be great to talk to Coach Martelli about what he's up to and what's next for him. So without further ado on the Whatever It Takes show, Coach Phil Martelli. Our world is changing faster and faster. Humans are constantly on the go. Over 70% of people are not happy in some way. They're living in the shadows of fear, especially in their careers and life. Are we humans doomed? I don't think so. And that's where I come in. My name is Joseph Stanley Reichowski, otherwise known as Joe Wu. Each week, I seek to uncover what it takes to truly live your life to the fullest by finding out through interviewing people what were their failures and what did it take for them to reach success. Their stories are truly inspiring and perhaps they'll inspire you to let go of your fear and live your career and life to the fullest. All right, everybody, we have Coach Phil Martelli here, the Associate Head Coach at the University of Michigan. Coach Martelli, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Glad to join anybody from that Delaware Valley area. That's it. That's it. Even though I'm a Villanova grad, I, I still love St. Joe's, so I have a heart for all Philly teams. So, <laughs> so I'm good. Uh, happy early birthday, by the way. Uh, your birthday's coming up in a few days, so uh, congrats. Thank and you um, I appreciate it. Yeah. So you started at Widener University, graduated, what was it, 19, I guess, 76, and then you went on to be assistant coach. So what got you into coaching? What was that like? Was it just the decision you said, I wanted to do this? Yeah. Um, when I was in the seventh grade, so about 12 or 13 years old, I moved from the city of Philadelphia to the suburbs, Lansdowne, Delaware County. And I just... Um, I went from a being what I would call affectionately a playground rat. If it was okay. winter, I played uh, football uh, in the spring and summer, played baseball um, in the fall, played football. Uh, and on occasion, when we had an opportunity, we'd be able to get into a gym and play basketball. When I moved to the suburbs, uh, it was it was a basketball kind of area. Right. And um, I met three guys, uh, Tom Gallagher, who was a banker, Pete O'Keefe, a politician, and John Steele, a postman. And uh, I was on a really good team as a seventh grader. Uh, I played and the game captured me in wow. that um, I was amazed that a group, these three guys could get a group of young people to all do kind of similar things in the pursuit of a championship. And wow. um, I recognized the game as being non-discriminatory. The game didn't matter if you were black or white, didn't matter if you were rich or poor, didn't right. matter if you were suburbs or city. And um, I, I want, I played all the time, but I got, I got uh, probably in the eighth grade, got really caught up in, like, this is what coaching is. This is like taking a group and pushing them in a direction um, and making a difference. So probably okay. from when I was in the ninth grade, uh, that was oh, wow. when I was determined to be uh, a coach. But at that point in time, 
I wanted to be a high school coach and a high school teacher. Uh, oh, neat. When I got into high school, uh, high school coaching, that's when I started to think, well, I wonder if these ideas would work if you had better players. And right. uh, that that's how it all came to be. Wow, that's neat. And then you wound up uh, St. Joe's as an assistant for uh, a number of years. So what was that like kind of transitioning from from high school to, to college being an assistant and then ultimately getting the St. Joe's um, head coaching job? Well, I treated the high school job very much like a college program. I mean, we right. had a, we, we were 12 months a year. Uh, we were very detailed in terms of practice. We were very detailed uh, in, in terms of scouting. Um, and I always felt like there was more to learn. So I, I always prided myself each spring and summer to, to see what else I could learn while I was a high school coach. When I went to college, um, the thing that caught me right away was the scouting. I, I, I enjoyed uh, seeing seeing a way that maybe we could win a game, maybe when we were outmanned. Um, I, I've always had a big, uh, a special place in my heart for practice. I love practice. I love right. practice. I think practice is very much like you're the teacher in a classroom and you can impact uh, learning. Uh, you can impact relationships and you go day by day in a classroom. I always felt the games were like a test and no right. coach, no coach uh, or no teacher over talks during a test. Right. So that's the way I, I felt the, the games were. Um it was certainly um, an experience being in college. I would say bigger stage right. with the same platform, with the wow. same kind of teaching being first and foremost for me. It's neat. That's a neat way of looking at it, too, just like it's a, the game's test. Right. It's a test. I thought of it that way. Yeah. Right. And see what, what, they're, what they're doing. And, and no, matter how, no matter how good a student you are, there's right. always an anxiety during the test. So I felt the same about the game. And if I wow. added to that anxiety by, by yelling and jumping and moving and that, that, yeah, I, I did my share of barking at referees and that kind of thing. But sure. I always felt, I always felt that it was important that the players get a sense of calm from the coach during the games. Great. And you can see that. I mean, I always loved your demeanor on the court and, and of course, yeah, we all go after referees. I did some coaching and, uh, that's a tough aspect of it, but I always liked how you manage the games. And I went to a lot of Nova St. Joe's games and always, always watched and always admired how you, how you did that and how you handled things very professionally. So that's great. Thank you. Great. Um, so you had an amazing run at, at St. Joe's and I love the 2003, 2004 season. That was, that was something, even as a, as a Philly guy myself, uh, you know, that would say all the rivalry, the Holy war and, and, but we were still rooting for you no matter what. I, I think it was an amazing run with Jameer and, and Delante. That's definitely one for the books. Um, very special season. Obviously didn't turn out at the end winning a national championship, you know, came close. Um, how do you manage kids like that? You know, the student athletes, because obviously, you know, you go undefeated in the regular season and kids have got to be just going crazy inside. So how do you as a coach manage that level of just like, Hey, we think we're going to win it all. I, I always, um, uh... I always felt that staying consistent. So for me, the things that were consistent, daily improvement, effective communication, appreciate opportunities. So that was always what we talked about. We didn't talk about 16 and 0. We didn't talk about 20 and 0. Right. We didn't talk about being the number one seed. It was just what is this, what can this day give us? Can this can this day we become better as a team and right. we have daily improvement. Can each individual player be touched? And then you used a word in there that really is, is what I pride myself on during that remarkable year is that I managed that. I, I wanted them to, I wanted them to be college freshmen. I wanted them to be college seniors, whatever year in school they were. I wanted right. them to be boyfriends. I wanted them to be friends. I wanted them to be sons, grandsons. So as much as I could, I took it off their plate 
in terms of while well, the media would like this or or yeah. uh, uh, we never closed the practice. Every practice that we had at St. Joseph's was always an open practice. So we would have people all day, every day in practice watching. I wanted them to be used to uh, crowds and the attention and the task at hand was on the court. Uh, the only thing that I've, I've ever had cause uh, to pause for was I hope that they under, understood what they did. You made right. a great point. A Philadelphia guy, a, a uh, Villanova guy. It didn't matter. That yeah. team captured people's uh, – they captured their emotions because they were such – they played the game. It was a beautiful style. Uh, there was none of the gyrations that go into – today's right. world yeah. uh, and i and i hope i hope that in their way they they were able to have the joy um i have a reunion coming up with that team and i sent oh, wow. them a tip saying the thing that the thing uh that i recognize and it's still in the front of my brain wherever i went if i went to church if i stopped at the dry cleaner if I was stopped at a traffic light and somebody recognized me, here's what I saw. I always saw smiles. That team provided That's smiles, very much like the great teams that we've had in Philadelphia, the national championship teams that Villanova's right. had. When you think of them, you can't do anything but smile. And right. they create memories for a lifetime. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, no, that's true. And, and it was funny, a friend of mine and I were big basketball fans and we brought that up at St. Joe's and I kind of like smiled. He goes, you're an overgrad and you smile. I was like, yeah, it just, it brought joy because it was great to see Philadelphia succeed in other school. Like, and that's what we want deep down, even though we have these rivalries or whatever, you know, behind the scenes, we're like, all right, I, I want to see them go all the way. It would have been great. And we were crushed when it, when it didn't happen, but it was still a, a magnificent season. So that was great. Yeah, really wonderful. Just a, um, a moment in time, really, a moment yeah. in time and a standard, a standard for how you play, how you prepare, and hopefully how you enjoy uh, the task at hand. Yeah, and I think that was a great era in, in I think, Philadelphia College basketball, obviously with Nova winning, you know, last couple of years. But I think the early 2000s, I think back to, like, you being coach, and then you had Bruiser Flynn, you know, Coach Wright, Coach Cheney, Coach Dunphy. I mean, that is just the, the five I mean, just – that is something I always treasure just watching. What was it like coaching against all these guys? Just, and I felt like a lot of you guys were similar in the, in your styles. But what was that like to, to be there? Well, the first thing is that uh, those guys were my friends. And so everybody out there has had the experience of being in their backyard and playing two hand touch with their brother or right. the kid across the street or their cousin, man, you want to win. But you also you also do not want the game to um, supersede the relationship. So right. yeah, it was a, it was a extraordinary opportunity because they were so good. I mean, you think about those names you just rattled off: yeah. Jay Wright, Hall of Famer; John Cheney, Hall of Famer; uh, Fran Dunphy. Like, if there's a Hall of Fame for human beings, you know he's in that easily. Yep. Um, so to have that opportunity uh, to not just match wits, because look, coaching is an ego driven business. You right. have to think that you can do it better than the guy down the street or right. you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. And so every the challenge in Philadelphia was you wanted to promote your program better than the other guy. You wanted to run your summer camp better than the other guy. If you did radio, you wanted to do radio. If you did public speaking, you want and and as you prepared your team, it was always with the the idea of if we can be if we can be the top dog in Philadelphia, then we're a national team. That's how it's always right. been in Philadelphia. The top right. dog is a national power, and we were fortunate during that run to have that opportunity. Yeah, it was an amazing time. I, I went to so many games and just being at, you know, being at the Palestra. Uh, my dad took me there when I was four and five and six years old. So taking the family there and, and just just being in that environment was some, something special. It really is when you think about it. And the biggest thing about that is the noise, the yeah. noise in that building. And I've always said this. 
If you were to go into that building right now and there is no game, if you go to that building in the middle of July and there's nobody in there, right. you can hear the noise. That's a, that's one for people to think about. Like you can yeah. hear the noise. That's how special it is. And to have that opportunity in Philadelphia where I grew up, second to none. Yeah, can't, can't imagine that. So thinking about Philly, like what would be a favorite memory if you have one of, of coaching in Philly, would you say? I'm sure there's probably a lot. <laughs> well, I would say anytime I had the opportunity to walk on that, walk on that floor at the palestra. Right. And to then process like Jack Ramsey did this, Jack Kraft did this. Right. John Casey did this. And I'm not the greatest. I'm just the latest. And to to realize like that was that was such an honor. I think the second thing that pops to mind when you say coaching in Philadelphia is the big five coaches obviously get put on a pedestal and everybody looks up. Right. But you and I both know that we could get in a car and we could drive to Chester high school and we would see great coaching. Yeah. Where you could go watch Speedy Mars coach at Roman Catholic or St. Joe's prep right. or, or, uh, uh, her McGee at Philadelphia textile and whatever it's called, right. you know, how many ever names they've had. <laughs> I think to know that in Philadelphia, um, to be recognized for the person that you are much more important than the coach. And I always took that. Um, I took that badge, Philadelphia basketball. All right. That's a badge that I wear proudly and wore proudly. That's a great badge though. <laughs> Definitely. That's awesome. So I know in, in 2019, obviously, you know, St. Joe's went in a different direction. Um, and you had a great opportunity to, um, to go work at Michigan. What was that transition like? Obviously going from Philly to University of Michigan and with, with Coach Howard. Like what was that kind of like? You know, him reaching out to you and then just transitioning from one place to another? Uh very daunting. And I'm not sure that it's five years later, it's still not daunting. Um, here's the way I answer it. The basketball is unbelievable. The right. big ten, the coaching, the offensive minds the competition, the players, it's that, that part is terrific. Uh, the way they treat me is just absolutely terrific. Uh, whether it's, it's the housekeeping people, fans, uh, the players, the managers, it, 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 it just, it touches me. And I don't know if I've, if I've said thank you enough to all the people that have touched me. Uh, but saying all that, I miss home and I miss my family. My wife still lives in media. My okay. daughter has four children. She lives in the media area. She's a school teacher. My uh, son is in Rhode Island. He's associate head coach at, at uh, Bryan College. My, oh, wow. my other son is now assistant coach at Penn State. Uh, but I miss, I miss Philadelphia terribly. I miss... I miss, and this sounds crazy, I miss going where I can make a difference. So it could be a school, going to right. speak to school. It could be going to pick up a check for coaches versus cancer. That's right. it, it could be visiting in a hospital. It could be going to a funeral. Like that sounds morbid, but I miss those opportunities where I think that the person that I am could make a difference. Um not the coach that I am, not the title that I have. Right. Um, but I but I do. I miss I miss Philadelphia and I miss my family terribly. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's, that's tough, I'm sure. And, and then I guess with the season though, it seems like seasons now are pretty much Amen. all year long. Yeah, so you're, yeah. you are so, you you're absolutely like, when's the season start? No, right. <laughs> Never. Is, when does it end? Always. Right. Yeah, it's, it's always going. <laughs> Close down a little bit, but not often. And yeah. um it, you you are absolutely positively right that um, you're always busy. You're always doing right. basketball. And as we talked before we went on, like this is a recruiting period coming up. And 
I'll be away from campus. Uh, and then at the same time, we start on the court three, four days a week in uh, September. Right. Practice starts as early as September 26th or 7th. So it really is. It, it, it has become a very, very, very long year. Right. How do you balance that, though? Because I know, like you said, your family's heavily in basketball. You know, your wife, uh, Judy, played at Immaculata and won some championships. So obviously basketball runs deep in, in your family. You're a Philly guy. So how do you have that that balance? Because obviously you need to take vacation. You need to take a break and you need to unwind. So what, what's the method to your madness, so to speak, to, to just kind of take that break if you need to? Well, it's not easy, but I would say that uh, with Jawan Howard, Jawan Howard is such a special guy in that he does make it family first. It's always family first. So if certain things come up, you know, I'm not just for instance, my high school, St. Joe's prep put me in their hall of excellence in the spring. All right. I need to go home for two days and the Philadelphia, uh, uh, Philadelphia sports hall of fame or, a funeral, you know, unfortunately, Rap Curry, a great, great, great player, great right. person that I recruited and coach St. Joe, I had to go home. I have to be home for his funeral. So, so that yeah. part is, uh, it does feel there are times when it gets um, awkward because I did sign up, you know, I did say, this is what I want to do. Right. And then, uh, but then, to take those opportunities. I just finished a 10 day vacation with my family, but I didn't see my son from Penn state. I didn't see my son uh, from Brian. So uh, families in this business uh, are underappreciated, right? Yeah. The, the, the sacrifices that families make is absolutely extraordinary. And none of us, none of us could be on a sideline without very supportive spouses and children understanding. Now, you might miss something, right? But you also, you know, when I was in Philadelphia, I could get to my daughter's high school basketball games when she was at Mary and Mercy. Uh, right. I I could get to see them in a school play in the middle of the day because I was in charge of my time. Right. Uh, so, and they've had remarkable experiences. You know, like my children have met a lot of people and and consider a lot of people to be uh, almost family uh, that we've met along the way. So you have to incorporate your family in this. You are right. not a separate entity from your family. Yeah, that's, that's a great way of looking at it. And me as an entrepreneur running some businesses, it, I feel the same way, even though I'm not, I, I could take a little bit of time and, and kind of unwind, but the phone rings, hey, you got to answer it. You know, you got business coming in, you got a deal coming in. So I, I totally agree with you there. You got to had the family. And even with this, you know, I have my kids help editing, they enjoy it and we have some fun with it. So it does, it does. And plus it helps them grow a little bit too. So it's, it's a good, good thing. They, it, it, you know, I think if there's no matter what you do and obviously to be successful, there are sacrifices. Yeah. Uh, and extraordinary no sacrifices. What. Yeah. But I think that all of us could use family first as a mantra. That's great. I love that. It's really good. Um, switching gears a little bit. Um, I know, obviously, you know, we've got the big portal now and then NIL, which is name, image and likeness. And and for me, it's that's that's a mess. I, I think it's it's somewhat needed. But what, what's your take on all that? And how do you manage that now? Because it's you've got obviously got social media and then. You know, before, I guess, going to a recruit's house, you go to recruit, you have the parents there. And it's almost like now you've got a whole nother entity in this whole it's all a piece. So how do you manage that? Uh, managers and things like that. Here, here's what I would say. Um, one of the things about the business is that it has gone from a relationship driven business. How do I get to know your grandmother? How do I get to know what makes you tick? How, how do I have this opportunity to, to instill in you values uh, that will last a lifetime. And um, what we are now in is a relationship business for the yeah. next year. Here's what we will do for you. Here's what we would like you to do for us. Um, what I, where I am concerned and I'm all for, I'm all for uh, 
players that players provide, so they should be provided for. I'm all for, right. I'm all for that. Where I am concerned is that when let's pick a number, let's say that a kid is making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right, and basketball's not his job afterwards. So now this young man comes and he has to, he's going to get a job as a bank teller. He's right. not, he's not making $150,000. Yeah. So now he's lived as a young person making that kind of money. And uh, I just, I'm not certain that all of this coming together at the same time, transfer portal, NIL, I'm not certain that we've done enough to make sure that there's a balance and that we have young people who are really, and this is what the sport should bring you. The sport should bring you a uh, greater depth in your character and should set you up uh, for the future. Not, not for the future in dollars, but for the future in, yeah, I understand time management. I, I am fiscally responsible. Uh, right. All of those kind of ideas. Uh, I believe we rolled this out, and then you add in a COVID year. Yeah. And, uh, it's a mess. It's it's really not. It's not that relationship uh, opportunity, and the growth opportunities. I just don't want us to go too far down the road where kids can get hurt. Yeah. I agree. Cause at the end of the day, that's what's, that's what's going to happen. And you said it best. I mean, they're making 150, maybe 200, maybe even 75 and they start out somewhere entry level position. You're not going to be anywhere near there. And you're used to that. And it's, it's, it's a tough transition, especially no in the question, state. No, no, yeah. question, no question about it. And, and, yeah. uh, uh, and I just go back to that piece. Like, are we allowing our coaches and our players to build real relationships or is, are these all transactions? Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know that, and I'm not naive, but I don't know that transactional, a transactional world is the best place for college athletics. Yeah, I agree with you there. Cause I, I think, you know, you got to build those relationships and you look at, you know, you, like you said it earlier, you know, you're going to have a the reunion with, with your teams and that that's a huge relationship. And I mean, I couldn't believe the staggering number of kids in the, in the portal this year, it just blew my mind. And I was like, wow, this is crazy to, to see that. So hopefully it gets straightened out. And, and I agree with you. I, I, I do like the NIL. I think there's some really great things to it, but it's like, I'd love to see it all get ironed out because it's, it's a mess <laughs> and it's hard. It's hard. I mean, I guess the one thing on one hand, you know, my son and I were like, you know, on Twitter, like, oh, hey, where's TJ Obama going? Where's this guy going? Where's that guy going? So it was kind of fun as as a fan. But then I remember saying, wow, this is kind of a mess. I'm like, I don't really like this. I mean, it, there's some good to it, but it's like, oh, I don't know. It needs to get fixed. And I would say this on the portal. Um, what you want to do is you want to enter into and enter into a world where you say to a young person, um, I'm going to be with you through thick and thin. Yeah. So I want to be at your wedding. I want to celebrate the birth of your child. I want to congratulate you on your first job, but I also want to be there when you lose your job and mm -hmm. when you lose a loved one and you can build that relationship over two, three, four years. Right. But if you're someplace for eight months and the world caves in on you, but you were at some other place for eight months and some other place for eight months, where do you go back? Where do you hang your hat? Yeah. Who do you, whose door do you knock on and say, Hey, I need help. We all need help. Right. Need yeah. Help. And that's, and that's confusing for a kid. Yeah. yeah. We all need an ear and a heart. Uh, where do you go if you've only been there for six, seven months? Right. And I think I read somewhere a month ago or something, or maybe it was a couple of weeks ago, there's a kid that went to one school and then another, and then said, wait, now I'm going here. And it's like, third time in like a year or so. And I'm like, that's, there's no consistency, you know, going back to what you said earlier, there's no consistency. And as a kid, you'd be confused. Where do you turn to? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot to get figured out there for sure. Um, so thinking about, you know, coaches, obviously in this world, what advice would you give to a coach? Like let's say if 
new coach was coming up and wanted to break into the business, what would be one good piece of advice you could give to them? Um, make every effort to develop real relationships. And for a young coach coming up, it really has nothing to do with what you know. It does have everything to know, know, do with who you know. So make sure that if your dream is to coach at Delaware, if your dream is to coach at Sleazyanum, right, whatever that would be, make sure that those in your circle know what your your dreams and your aspirations are. Don't be afraid to 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 share your dreams and your aspirations. The second mm -hmm. thing that I would say to any young coach is, uh, you learn more through silence than you do by running your mouth. Oh, we have great. raised a generation. We've raised a generation of young people who always want to say, I think, or I saw, or I, <clears throat> yeah, you learn a lot more by silence than you do by noise. That's always great. be learning. Always be learning. Yeah. Listening. Just have that open ear. Yep. Wow. So what's next on the horizon for you? That's a really good question. Um, you were kind enough earlier to mention about my birthday. And so I'll be 69. It was always wow. my, in the back of my head to be done at 68, to go do something philanthropic, maybe do something in radio, <clears throat> maybe TV, uh, do games. Uh, and then when I got out here, I said, you know what? Let me Let me see how long this, can I stay in this? until we have the opportunity to coach on a that we have the opportunity to coach on a Monday night in April. And so um I'll say this. I'm closer to the end than the beginning. Right. Uh, but for right now I wanna I want to uh I want to enjoy every single day. And if if there's a day where I feel you know what? I'm not giving it my all or I have nothing more to give. Uh, then that'll be time to come home. Right. Wow. You've been great and you've been a wonderful addition to college basketball. I truly love what you do and, and, and how you shape so many young men. It's, it's been great. And, um, I appreciate your your time today. This has been great. I mean, I've really learned a lot from you and just, uh, just getting to know you a little bit more and just, Hearing these stories, amazing. Just it felt like it was like a trip down memory lane in Philadelphia too. <laughs> so You're very, yeah. very kind. Thank you for yeah. including me. Thank, thank you for the invitation to spend time with you. Yep. And I got one last question for you. So you're a Philly guy, right? So uh cheesesteak, where'd you go? Pat's Geno's or another place? <laughs> well, that's interesting because um uh now it seems like a long time ago. I gave up red meat and oh, so wow. I was really into the chicken cheesesteak and with Larry's being so close across the street, uh, right out the back door of the Hagen Arena, that was probably the go-to. But I would say, huh. I would say somebody coming from out of town, right. like if the coaches from Michigan are coming in, then I tell them to go to Dallas Andros right up the street from Philly. Oh, great call. That, That's a great place. Yeah. A lot of good little places out there too. And Dallas Andros gives you the whole Philly vibe. Like you have to get in line. Right. Sure, you know, like it's almost like uh, the the Seinfeld episode with the soup Nazi. And oh, yeah. you know, like you have to be ready. if you're not ready, then you're out of line. So um, I would say Dallas Andrews, Dallas Andrews. That's a great choice. That's awesome. Well, thanks coach, for joining us. Yeah, I really appreciate this today. This has been wonderful. Thank you. OK, was that not an awesome interview with Coach Martelli? Coach Martelli, thank you very much for agreeing to do the show. This was a lot of fun. I encourage all of you to rewatch this show again because there was a lot of great pieces of information here. Loved what he said about coaching where he said, you learn more by silence than you do by running your mouth. And I love the fact they talked about how the game is basically like a test and the classroom is the practice. So that's pretty cool. Just loved his philosophy on things and you can see He's a really dynamic coach, but also a really genuine person talking about taking care of his players, family, 
developing those relationships. And of course, when we talked about the whole NIL, the name, image, and likeness piece of it, uh, it's very frustrating for coaches because it is tougher to develop those relationships. But you can see how Coach Martelli uh, has navigated those waters and is still navigating those waters and working to make, I think, college better and college basketball much, much better. So thank you, Coach Martelli, for joining us. Time for me to get back on the court here. See you next time, everybody. Later.